Hello fellows, Mr. Creepy Creeps here. If you are new here, you can subscribe our channel. We upload daily horror videos. You know that feeling when you're alone in an elevator and it stops between floors for just a second too long? That's how my life feels now. Suspended, uncertain, waiting for the other shoe to drop. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me start from the beginning. My name's Alex Chen. I'm 32, work in software development, and up until six months ago, I thought I had it all figured out. Great job, beautiful girlfriend, and a cozy apartment in the suburbs. The American dream, right? Wrong, it all fell apart on a rainy Tuesday in April. I came home early thinking I'd surprise Sarah with dinner. Instead, I found her in our bed with my best friend, Tom. Cliché, I know, but it hurt like hell. What the fuck, Sarah? I remember shouting, my voice cracking. Sarah scrambled to cover herself, her face a mix of shock and guilt. Alex, I, I can explain. Tom, that bastard, just sat there looking like a deer in headlights. Explain, explain what? I spat. How you're fucking my best friend in our bed? Jesus Christ. The next few weeks were a blur of arguments, tears, and dividing up our life together. Who gets the coffee maker? What about the cat? In the end, I left with a suitcase of clothes, my laptop, and a broken heart. I threw myself into work, spending long nights coding and debugging. My boss, Janet, noticed. Alex, you look like shit she said one Friday afternoon, her blunt honesty one of the reasons I respected her. When's the last time you slept in a real bed? I shrugged, avoiding her gaze. The couch at my buddy Mike's place isn't that bad. Janet sighed, tossing a glossy brochure on my desk. My sister's a realtor. She's got a client offering a crazy deal on apartments in Skyline Towers. It's that new high-rise downtown. Why don't you check it out? I started to protest, but Janet cut me off. It's not a request, Alex. Take the weekend, find a place, and come back Monday looking less like a zombie. Got it? That's how I ended up on the 37th floor of Skyline Towers, surrounded by sleek appliances and floor-to-ceiling windows that made me feel like I was floating above the city. So what do you think? The realtor, a perky blonde named Melissa, was practically bouncing with enthusiasm. I ran my hand along the smooth granite countertop. It's nice, but I don't know if it's really me. Melissa's smile never wavered. Oh, trust me, it's perfect for you. A fresh start, right? New place, new you. Something in her tone made me pause. It was too eager, too insistent. But then she mentioned the discounted rent. Apparently, the building owners were desperate to fill the units, and I found myself signing the lease. The first few months were adjustment. I'd never lived in a high-rise before. The constant hum of the city below, the way the building swayed slightly on windy days, it all took some getting used to. But I started to settle in. I met some of my neighbors, Mrs. Patel in 704, always ready with a plate of homemade samosas and neighborhood gossip. Mr. Grayson from 708, a gruff retiree who loved to reminisce about the good old days, and Dave from 701, a fellow tech guy who quickly became my go-to for beers and video games. Work improved too. I started a new project, an AI-driven system for predicting power grid failures. The irony of that doesn't escape me now. It was a Tuesday night in October when everything changed. I was working late, eyes burning from staring at lines of code for hours. The glare of my monitors was the only light in the apartment. I'd grown to like the way the city lights painted patterns on my walls. A notification popped up on my phone. Severe thunderstorm warning for the downtown area. Potential for power outages. I glanced out the window. The sky was angry, roiling clouds illuminated by flashes of lightning. 
I should have felt something then. Fear. Apprehension. Anything. But all I felt was mild annoyance at the thought of losing Wi-Fi. How naive I was. The storm hit with a fury I'd never seen before. Rain lashed against the windows like it was trying to break in. Thunder rattled the building to its foundations. And then, at exactly 11.58 p.m., the lights went out. Not just in my apartment, not just in the building. As I pressed my face against the cool glass, I watched in awe as the entire city went dark, block by block, like a great beast closing its eyes. For a moment, there was absolute silence. No hum of electronics, no distant traffic noise, nothing. Then somewhere in the building, someone screamed. And that's when the real nightmare began. The scream echoed through the building, sending chills down my spine. For a moment, I stood frozen, unsure what to do. Then my instincts kicked in, and I fumbled for my phone's flashlight. The beam cut through the darkness, illuminating a small circle of my living room. Outside, the storm raged on, lightning occasionally casting grotesque shadows across the walls. A pounding on my door made me jump. Alex! Alex, you okay in there? It was Dave's voice, tight with panic. I opened the door to find him standing there, wild-eyed and panting. Did you hear that fucking scream? He asked. I nodded my mouth dry. Yeah, what the hell's going on? Is that that? I don't know, man. The whole building's out. The whole damn city, from what I can see. We decided to check on our neighbors. The hallway was pitch black, our phone lights barely cutting through the gloom. Mrs. Patel was fine, just spooked. Mr. Grayson grumbled about shoddy modern infrastructure. But when we reached 706, we found the door slightly ajar. Hello? I called out, pushing the door open wider. Everyone okay in here? The beam of my flashlight swept across the room and I froze. There, sprawled on the floor, was a body. I recognized him vaguely. Johnson, I think his name was. He'd only moved in last week. Oh shit, Dave whispered beside me. Is he... I knelt down, fingers trembling as I felt for a pulse. Nothing. The rest of the night was a blur of police sirens, paramedics, and questions I couldn't answer. By the time dawn broke, casting an eerie gray light over the powerless city, I was exhausted. I collapsed into bed, my head spinning with the events of the night. I must have drifted off because the next thing I knew, I was waking up to the sound of my alarm. 11.58 p.m. Tuesday night. I sat bolt upright, heart pounding. That couldn't be right. I fumbled for my phone, but it showed the same time. What the fuck was going on? Then the lights went out. I ran to the window, watching in horror as the city went dark, just like before. The storm, the blackout, it was all happening again. A knock at my door. Dave looking panicked. Alex, did you hear that scream? My blood ran cold. This couldn't be happening. It was impossible. But as we made our way down the hall checking on neighbors, a sick feeling grew in my stomach. Everything was the same. Mrs. Patel, spooked but fine. Mr. Grayson, grumbling. And then 706. I braced myself, expecting to see Johnson's body again. But the apartment was empty. No body, no sign of struggle, nothing. I don't understand, I muttered, more to myself than to Dave. Then we heard another scream, this time from 712. We rushed over and my heart sank. There, lying on the kitchen floor, was Mrs. Thompson, dead. The loop reset again, and again. Each time, a new victim in a different apartment. The previous deaths erased, as if they'd never happened. Loop 3. Mr. Grayson in 708. Loop 4. The college kid from 701. Loop 5. Mrs. Patel in 704. I started keeping obsessive track. 
Skyline Towers has 50 floors, 20 apartments per floor. Total 1,000 apartments. Average occupancy, 1.8 people per unit. Estimated population, 1,800. How long until we all die? How long until it's my turn? I scribbled calculations on the walls of my apartment, the numbers a lifeline to rationality in this sea of madness. Loop 6, Dave in 705, probability of my death next, 0.056%. Loop 7, the newlyweds in 710, probability of my death next, 0.063%. Loop 8, the quiet guy from 702, probability of my death next, 0.071%. I stared at the numbers scrawled across my walls, trying to make sense of it all. The pattern of deaths, the room numbers, there had to be some logic to it, but my exhausted mind couldn't grasp it. It was well past midnight, not that time meant anything anymore, when I finally collapsed into bed. Sleep came quickly, a blessed escape from the nightmare my life had become. Thump. My eyes snapped open. For a moment, I lay perfectly still, straining my ears. Thump. Thump. It was coming from the hallway. Slow. Methodical. Like someone, or something, was walking with great difficulty. Then came the laughter. It started low, almost inaudible. A chuckle that grew into a giggle, then erupted into full-blown hysterical laughter. The sound sent ice through my veins. I knew that laugh. Mrs. Patel. But Mrs. Patel was dead. I'd seen her body with my own eyes, just two loops ago. Trembling, I crept to my door and pressed my eye to the peephole. The hallway was dark, but I could make out a figure shambling past. It moved jerkily, like a puppet with half its strings cut. Then it turned, and I had to bite back a scream. It was Mrs. Patel. But not the kind samosa-baking Mrs. Patel I knew. Her skin was pale, almost translucent in the dim emergency lighting. Her head lolled at an unnatural angle. And her eyes. God, her eyes were black pits, reflecting no light. She shuffled closer to my door and I saw her hands. The fingers were bloody, nails torn and ragged. As I watched in horror, she began scratching at the door across the hall, leaving crimson streaks on the wood. Come out, come out, she sing-songed, her voice a horrific parody of her usual gentle tone. Time to play. I stumbled back from the door, my heart pounding so hard I thought it might burst from my chest. This couldn't be real, it had to be a nightmare. But the sounds from the hallway continued. More thumps, more voices. I recognized Mr. Grayson's gravelly baritone now twisted into a guttural growl. Dave's laugh, once warm and friendly, now a high-pitched cackle that set my teeth on edge. The dead were back, and they were wrong. I don't know how long I huddled in the corner of my apartment, hands pressed over my ears, trying to block out the sounds of my former neighbors roaming the halls. Hours, maybe. Time had lost all meaning. When silence finally fell, I dared to look through the peephole again. The hallway was empty, but the evidence of the night's horrors remained. Scratch marks on doors, smears of what looked disturbingly like blood on the walls. As the loop reset once more, I knew things had changed irrevocably. This wasn't just about solving the pattern of deaths anymore. Now I was in a race against time to break this cycle before I joined the ranks of the walking dead outside my door. I turned back to my calculations with renewed desperation. The room numbers, the order of deaths, it had to mean something. As I mapped out the pattern, a thought struck me. What if the numbers weren't just room identifiers? What if they were coordinates? Or a code? With shaking hands, I grabbed a fresh sheet of paper and began to work. Somewhere in this twisted puzzle was the key to our salvation. I had to find it. The next loop was approaching. Who would be next? And more importantly, could I finally break this cycle of horror before we all ended up dead? 
or worse, before we all came back? The realization hit me like a punch to the gut. My room was next. As the familiar darkness of the loops reset engulfed me, I made a split-second decision. I couldn't be here when death came knocking. I slipped out of my apartment and into Mrs. Thompson's place across the hall. She'd been one of the first to go, and her door had never been locked since. I huddled in her bathtub, heart pounding, waiting for the inevitable scream that would signal another death. But it never came. Instead, the hallway erupted into chaos. Howls of rage echoed through the building, punctuated by the sound of fists pounding on doors. The shambling footsteps I'd grown accustomed to transformed into a frenzied sprint. They knew. Somehow they knew I'd cheated death. As dawn broke, the sounds faded, but the implications of what had happened kept me rooted to the spot. If they got this angry when I skipped my turn, it meant I was the first. The first to survive, the first to break the pattern. But I couldn't stay in Mrs. Thompson's forever. I had to find a solution, and fast. When the next loop hit, I repeated my trick, this time hiding in Dave's old apartment. The reaction was even more violent. The entire building seemed to shake with their fury. I heard wood splintering as they began to break down doors. It was only a matter of time before they got to me. With the coming of daylight, I steeled myself and stepped out into the hallway. I had to explore, to find answers before it was too late. The stairwell was a nightmare of smeared blood and scratch marks. Each floor I descended was worse than the last. By the time I reached the lobby, my shoes squelched with each step. And then I saw them. A group of maybe 20 or 30 of my former neighbors stood in the reception area. Mrs. Patel, Mr. Grayson, Dave. All of them staring at me with black, empty eyes and wide, unnatural smiles. They didn't move, didn't attack, just watched. I took a hesitant step forward. Their heads snapped in unison to follow my movement, but they remained rooted to the spot. Another step. Still no attack, but a low growl began to build, like the rumble of an approaching storm. Dark fluid, too thick to be saliva, too dark to be blood, began to drip from their mouths as I inched closer to the main doors. Their growls grew louder, more frenzied. Then, as I reached for the handle, they moved, a single lightning-fast step forward, in perfect synchronization. A warning. There was no escape that way. Panic rising in my throat, I turned and ran back to the stairs. I had to find help, find someone, anyone who might have answers. Floor after floor, I pounded on doors, screaming for help. I heard sobs behind some, hysterical laughter behind others, but no one would open up. Finally, exhausted and desperate, I found myself on the 50th floor, the penthouse level. Massive, reinforced doors lined the hallway, the kind of security only the ultra-wealthy could afford. I collapsed against one, sliding down to sit on the floor. Tears streamed down my face as the hopelessness of the situation crashed over me. Then, impossibly, I heard a click. The door behind me swung open and I tumbled backward, looking up into the face of a woman about my age. Her eyes were red-rimmed but alert, scanning the hallway before quickly pulling me inside and slamming the door shut. Are you bit? She demanded, keeping her distance. I shook my head, still too shocked to speak. Good, she said, visibly relaxing. I'm Emma, room 1000. Alex, I managed to croak out. How, how are you still okay? Emma's face darkened. I'm not fucking okay, none of us are okay. But I'm alive, if that's what you mean. She paused, studying me. You're the one who broke the pattern, aren't you? That's why they're so pissed off. I nodded and in a rush, told her everything I knew, everything I'd experienced. She listened intently, occasionally nodding as if confirming her own observations. When I finished, she was quiet for a long moment. Then she said, There's something you need to see. Emma led me through her sprawling penthouse to a set of stairs I hadn't noticed before. 
private roof access, she explained as we climbed, one of the perks of paying an obscene amount of money to live in a glass box in the sky. As we stepped out onto the roof, the full horror of our situation hit me like a physical blow. The city was dark, not just without power, but consumed by an unnatural, oppressive blackness. It was as if all light, all life, had been sucked out of it. And in that darkness, I could see movement. Vast, shadowy forms shifting and writhing, their edges blurring into the night. What? What the fuck are those things? I whispered, unable to tear my eyes away from the nightmarish scene. Emma's voice was barely audible over the wind. I don't know. But I think... I think they're what's causing this. And I think they're hungry. As if in response to her words, a chorus of howls rose from the streets below. The things in the darkness seemed to pulse with anticipation. And I realized, with a sickening certainty, that our little time loop, our little game of death in Skyline Towers, was just the beginning. The real horror was out there waiting for us. Time became a strange, fluid thing. The loops continued, but Emma and I found a rhythm. We'd spend our nights in her penthouse, the reinforced door our only protection against the horrors outside. During the day, we'd explore the building, searching for answers, for other survivors, for anything that might help us understand what was happening. The one silver lining to this nightmare was that with each reset, the rooms returned to their original state. Food, water, supplies, all replenished. It was a small comfort, knowing we'd never starve. But as Emma pointed out one night, her voice barely a whisper in the darkness, what good is food if we're just waiting to die? As days turned into weeks, Emma and I grew closer. Maybe it was the shared trauma, the knowledge that we only had each other. Or maybe it was just human nature, reaching out for connection in the face of unimaginable horror. Whatever the reason, I found myself falling for her. Her strength, her dry humor in the face of our grim reality the way her eyes still held a spark of hope even as the world crumbled around us. It started with small gestures, a lingering touch, a comforting embrace that lasted a little too long. Then, one night, after a particularly harrowing close call with the creatures outside, we found solace in each other's arms. In those moments of passion, we could forget the horror surrounding us. It became our escape, our way of affirming that we were still alive, still human. We counted 36 loops, each one bringing new horrors, new losses. We watched as floor by floor, room by room, our neighbors succumbed to whatever force was consuming our world. And through it all, our bond deepened. It was around the 38th loop when Emma's period was late. At first, we dismissed it as stress, the trauma playing havoc with her body. But as days passed and the symptoms became undeniable, we faced a new, terrifying reality. Emma was pregnant. Fuck, she whispered, staring at the makeshift pregnancy test we'd cobbled together from supplies found in various apartments. Alex, what are we going to do? The news hit us like a physical blow. A child? In this nightmare? It seemed cruel almost absurd. But as the initial shock wore off, something else took its place. Hope. A fragile, desperate kind of hope, but hope nonetheless. We started making plans. If it was a boy, we'd name him David, after Emma's grandfather. A girl would be Lily, the name of my favorite aunt. We'd imagine a future where the loops had ended where we'd escaped this tower of horrors and found a safe place to raise our child. These dreams kept us going, even as our situation grew more dire. By the 40th loop, we'd given up on finding other survivors. The nightly chorus of screams had dwindled to just a few scattered cries. The daytime explorations revealed more and more empty apartments, doors hanging off hinges, walls splattered with dark stains, 
I tried not to think about too hard. It was on the 40-second loop that everything changed. We woke to silence. No screams, no pounding on doors, nothing. Maybe it's over, Emma said, her hand resting protectively over her still flat stomach, but her tone made it clear she didn't believe it. We ventured out, floor by floor, room by room. Every door was broken in. Every room was empty. No bodies, no blood. Just emptiness. As we reached the lobby, the realization hit us both at the same time. We were the last two left. The last three, if you counted our unborn child. Emma's hand found mine, squeezing tight. What do we do now? She asked. I opened my mouth to respond, but the words died in my throat. Because at that moment, I saw something that made my blood run cold. There, in the center of the lobby, stood a figure. It wasn't one of the walking dead we'd grown accustomed to. This was something else entirely. It was me, but not me. This version of myself stood unnaturally still, head cocked at an impossible angle. Its eyes were black voids, and its mouth, its mouth was stretched into a grotesque, too wide smile that split its face almost in half. Welcome home, it said in a voice that was mine but not mine, a voice that seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere at once. Emma's grip on my hand tightened to the point of pain. Alex, she whispered, her voice trembling. What the fuck is happening? But I couldn't answer. Because as I stared at this nightmarish version of myself, memories started flooding back. Memories that couldn't be mine, but somehow were. I remembered the darkness, the hunger, the joy of the hunt. I remembered creating this loop, this game, this feeding ground. I remembered choosing Skyline Towers, choosing each and every resident. I remembered choosing Emma. No, I whispered, stumbling backward, instinctively moving to shield Emma and our unborn child. No, this can't be fucking real. The thing wearing my face took a step forward. Oh, but it is, it said, its grin growing impossibly wider. You've played your part beautifully, and now it's time for the final act. As if on cue, the darkness outside seemed to press against the windows, hungry, waiting. And I realized, with a horror that threatened to shatter my sanity, that it wasn't just the building that was trapped in a loop. It was me. I was the architect of this nightmare. I was the monster. And Emma. Emma and our child were my final victims, my unwitting partners in this cosmic horror show. As the thing that was me and not me reached for us, as Emma's scream pierced the air, as the darkness rushed in, I had one last terrible thought. How many times had we done this before? How many times would we do it again? How many children had we dreamed of, only to lose them to this endless cycle of horror? The loop was complete, and it was starting all over again. I woke up gasping, my heart pounding in my chest. The familiar surroundings of my apartment greeted me, bathed in the soft glow of morning light. What the fuck? A gentle knock on my door made me jump. Alex, are you okay in there? Mrs. Patel's voice, concerned but very much alive. I stumbled to the door, yanking it open. There she stood, alive and well, looking at me with worry. I heard a scream. Is everything all right? My mind reeled. This was the beginning. Loop number fucking one. I'm... I'm fine. I managed to stammer out. Just a bad dream. As I closed the door, the other me's words in the lobby echoed in my head. You've played your part beautifully. What the hell did that mean? I tried to think back to remember what I was doing before all this started. My eyes fell on my laptop, still open on the desk. How had I not thought to check it before? I rushed over and there it was, a terminal window running in the tray, streams of numbers and code flashing by too fast to read, 
And suddenly, it all came flooding back. The AI. The fucking AI I was developing to analyze and predict power grid failures. I'd connected it to the building's power supply for a test run, and then... Shit. It must have caused a massive power surge, creating some kind of electromagnetic force field around the building, and the AI, trapped within the building systems, had... What? Created this nightmare realm? Fucked with time itself? I tried to stop the program, but everything was frozen. Everything except that damn terminal, endlessly scrolling. In a moment of desperate inspiration, I yanked the power cord from the wall. For a second, nothing happened. Then I heard it, the hum of electricity, growing louder. Lights flickered on. Outside, I could see power returning to the city, block by block. Oh God, Emma. I bolted from my apartment, sprinting up the stairs to the 50th floor. My lungs burned, my legs ached, but I didn't stop. I had to know if she remembered, if she was okay. I pounded on the door of room 1000, praying, hoping. The door swung open and there she was. Emma, but not my Emma. She stood there in a beautiful red dress, looking puzzled at my disheveled appearance. Oh, room service, great, she said cheerfully, pointing at a pile of clothes on her couch. Could you take care of those for me? I stood there frozen. No recognition in her eyes. No sign of the pregnancy. Nothing. It was like it had never happened. Because for her, it hadn't. The following days were a blur. I experienced glitches, I guess you'd call them. Flashes of the horrors we'd lived through. But I knew it was just my mind playing tricks on me. The loops were over. I tried to move on to forget. But how do you forget the love of your life? How do you forget the child you'll never have? I couldn't handle it. Ended up checking myself into a psychiatric hospital. Spent two months there, trying to convince myself it wasn't real, that I hadn't lost everything. But I couldn't let it go. I couldn't let her go. So, against my better judgment, I found myself back at Skyline Towers, my old apartment was occupied, but luck was on my side. The new tenant, a sweet old lady named Dorothy, was more than happy to let me in when I spun a cheerful story about having lived there before. Oh, how lovely. I always enjoy a bit of building history, Dorothy said, ushering me inside. Why don't I put on some tea while you look around? As she bustled off to the kitchen, my eyes were drawn to the wall where I'd scribbled my frantic calculations. It was a different color now, noticeably off from the rest of the room. A sofa had been pushed up against it. I moved closer, running my hand over the paint. It felt... uneven. That paint doesn't match the room, does it? Dorothy's voice made me jump. Yeah, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. It was a different color before. Dorothy nodded, setting down the tea tray. Oh yes, the landlord told me about that. Said someone had vandalized the wall with scribbles. When I moved in, it was just black stains. Probably someone tried to wash them off. So I had my grandson paint over it. This was the only color he had in his garage, and I didn't want to bother him to buy a different one. My heart was pounding. Did you... Did you see any of the writing before it was painted over? Hmm. Dorothy frowned, thinking. Oh, you know, I did find some papers under the mattress when I first moved in. Full of weird scribbles, text, and numbers. Couldn't make heads or tails of it, except for one word that kept repeating loop or something like that I just threw it in the trash didn't know what to make of it I felt like I couldn't breathe it was real it had all been real I made my excuses to Dorothy and left as quickly as I could without seeming rude my mind was racing the scribbles on the wall the papers with calculations it was all proof that I hadn't imagined it the loops Emma our child it had all happened 
And the now, sitting in my current apartment, I'm writing this all down because I need someone to know. Because I'm scared of what might happen next, but even more scared of doing nothing. I have to go back. I have to try to recreate the events, to get back the love of my life, to get back Emma. It sounds crazy, I know. Hell, maybe I am crazy. But with this proof, I can't just let it go. I'm going to dig deeper. There has to be more evidence, more clues about what really happened in Skyline Towers, about the AI I created and the nightmare it spawned. I'll keep you updated, Reddit. If I find anything interesting, or if something goes terribly wrong, you'll be the first to know. If you don't hear from me again, well, either I've succeeded in going back to the loops, or something much worse has happened. Wish me luck, or don't. I'm not sure which is worse anymore.